process of entry, so at airports uh, and seaports. <clears throat> nobody should be held in a CBP, ideally nobody should be held in a CBP facility for more than 72 hours. Generally, CBP is able to make all of those decisions and determinations about what they need to do with a person under 72 hours. The kinds of facilities that they have where they hold people um, are not designed to be long-term facilities. These are, you may have seen pictures what these, a lot of these facilities look like this past summer when they, when they were really overcrowded, people were there for a long time. But they're usually very small rooms. Um, they have cement floors, cement benches. There's no windows to the outside. Lights are on 24 hours a day. There's no beds or, um, and oftentimes people report feeling very cold or not having enough blankets or food while they're there. After, after 72 hours or before 72 hours, ideally, a person is then, if the government decides that the person does not have authorization to be in the United States, they're going to transfer them. If it's an unaccompanied child, they go to the Office of Refugee Reception. They have responsibility for the care and custody of unaccompanied children. If it is an adult, they will go to a ICE facility, an Immigration Customs Enforcement facility. Or if it is a family unit traveling together, ICE may or may not decide to hold that person in a family ICE, prior to uh, the summer of 2014, only had one facility where families were held. It was a very small facility up in Pennsylvania that only had 90 beds. ORR has a series of shelters and programs throughout the United States where they hold unaccompanied children. Four different types of unaccompanied children are held. Um, from the least to most restrictive, it is short-term and long-term foster care programs. There are shelters and group homes. There's therapeutic foster care and residential treatment facilities. And then most secure are the staff secure and secure facilities, which are usually a wing in a juvenile jail. The placement determination for ORR is usually based on this, this uh, what ORR determines is a security risk, what kind of security risk a child will have. And then they make the determination in one of these four levels of security uh, facilities that they'll be placed in. Now the ORR system, Although it is detention because a child cannot necessarily leave on their own, it's designed to be more of like an alternative to a detention. Um, the custody, the care and custody of children was taken away from ICE, who is the prosecutor in the immigration cases, and given to a different entity. Um, so it's not the prosecutor that's holding on to the child, but instead it's a separate program. It's designed to be uh, the least restrictive setting where they take into consideration the best interest of the child. So the, the ORR system is very different than the ICE or the CBP facilities. <clears throat> now prior to the summer of 2014, children when they were in ORR facilities, they were generally there for about two, or two to three months. During that time they were getting a host of social services, they were getting legal screenings, um, they were getting uh, schooling and a thorough review of the reunification process. The Women's Refugee Commission, where I work, we spend a lot of our time monitoring uh, places of detention for immigrants. Um, in order to have access to them, there's different uh, ways that you go about it with the different agencies. ICE has a formal access policy, so they have a, a public policy in which anybody can request access to the facilities to go in and to do monitoring visits for civil society. ORR and CBP do not have similar policy. It's more of a closed process, it's relatively ad hoc, and there's no regular outside monitoring. Now I bring this up because monitoring is incredibly important for immigration detention in, in all aspects of the United States. Um, many of you may have heard that there was a, um, reports of hundreds of children who were, um, several children who were sexually abused in ORR facilities. <coughs> There have been recent reports of sexual abuse at an ICE family facility. And this summer, there were over 100 complaints filed regarding abuse of children in Customs and Border Protection facilities. Um, now, Customs and Border Protection facilities, this is a, even more worrisome because there is not only not uh, no regular outside monitoring, but there is no access to an attorney for a person who's in a CBP facility. And there's no anonymous way of filing a complaint um, about mistreatment while they're in the CBP facilities. So now that you have kind of an idea of how people normally move through the system, what is it that happened this summer and how have things changed? So this summer there's obviously a huge increase in numbers in a short amount of time that put incredible strain on the system. The normal processes did not work and as a result we saw lots of media reports 
Uh, we saw <laughs> photos of children and families being held in CBP facilities in overcrowded areas for long periods of time. Um, and we saw um, pictures and stories of families being dropped off at bus stations. And so everybody was very worried. And all, all of this fueled this idea that there was this crisis at the border. So the US government had to respond. They had to do something in response to all of these numbers coming, and really kind of this Media, media disaster, really, this summer of, of what was happening. So there are two big changes that the government made in terms of detention. The first is ORR streamlined the reunification process. So what does that mean? I mentioned that children normally spend two to three months in an ORR facility, and during that time they're getting all sorts of services. Their immigration cases are moving forward, and a child stayed in the facility until reunification with an adult sponsor or family member could happen. So the child could leave the OR detention facility and live with somebody in the community in the United States while they were going through the immigration court process. In response, in order to handle so many children coming in such a short amount of time and trying to get the kids out of the CBP facilities as quickly as they could, OR streamlined their procedures. So they really reduced the amount of time in which children were spending in ORR. So instead of two to three months, it was closer to seven to ten days. Um, there are a lot of advantages to that, I mean, particularly as the Women's Refugee Commission, we don't want to see people being detained if it's unnecessary. There were, however, concerns about that, that during the streamlining process, that they were cutting some corners and really not going through all the safety precautions that are needed when you are going to be reunifying a child with somebody who we don't know who that child is. Um, there were a lot of growing pains. There were changes that ORR was doing um, during the streamlining process. They were testing some things out. They found some things worked, some things didn't. Um, and, and it was kind of a learning process for everybody this summer about what really needs to happen during that reunification process and what phases could be skipped. The other thing the government did is they dramatically increased family detention. <clears throat> so in response, I said earlier there was only previously one facility, very small facility in Pennsylvania, that was a family facility that held uh, families in ICE detention. In response to the large number of family units traveling together this summer, and as a way to try to deter um, migrants from coming here, the U.S. government expanded family detention, so they opened three new family detention facilities. So the number of beds now in the United States for families who are going to be detained in ICE facilities has increased over 300 <clears> percent. The intent of this was to send a clear message of deterrence through expedited detention and removal. Now, the Women's Refugee Commission believes that these new family detention facilities and any policies that would oppose release or bond of these family members really ignores our obligations under international and U.S. laws, and they impose enormous moral and fiscal costs on our country. Now, we need to think about, nobody wanted to see, and nobody wants to see, again, children or families being held in uh, overcrowded stations. Nobody wants to see the backlog that we did last year. Nobody wants to see people being released to dangerous situations or places where they can't take care of somebody. On the other hand, we don't want to go too far to the other extreme with this pendulum and just be locking up everybody and have places of detention where there's not regular outside monitoring, where civil society is not allowed to go in to make sure that we're taking care of the most vulnerable migrants who are coming here to the U.S. I know probably earlier panels today had talked a lot about the reasons why people are coming. Um, and when you really are thinking about the kinds of stories about why people are coming here, thinking that somebody <coughs> is not going to come just because they might be held in a detention facility is probably not logical, right? If somebody's fleeing for their lives just because they may be detained may not stop them from coming here in the first place. So I think what we really need to do is step back and think about what is it that worked this summer and what is it that didn't work this summer? Because if these numbers aren't, aren't going to go down, and it's unlikely because the conditions in these home countries have not changed dramatically since last summer, how is it that can we be most protective of the people who are coming here? I'll stop here and then happy to answer questions after my other colleagues speak. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is George Talton. Um, I am an assistant chief at the U.S. Border Patrol and uh, currently serve as advisor to the Commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Um, I think that was a very accurate description um, of a lot of what happened this past year. Um, I want to back up though and, and first say thank you for the opportunity to come to speak with you this afternoon. Um, I think it's a, a great chance for us to continue um, what I think um, we're, we're now building as uh, a tremendously 
um, good engagement uh, partnership between um, CBP and a lot of you in this room. A lot of us meet almost on a weekly basis at this point, um, which is very important. Uh, CBP went through some tremendous changes in the last year, some very exciting changes. As many of you know, um, we have a new commissioner who started at the beginning of FY14. Um, he is absolutely committed to accountability and transparency within um, the agency, and I think um, this is representative of, of, of that effort. Um, we also saw some things last year that we had never really seen before, and I think much of that was just described. Um, CBP, Border Patrol agents, um, Customs and Border Protection officers, um, we, we have apprehended and encountered um, children and family units through all of our careers. Um, myself, I started in San Diego sector and, and certainly encountering um, families and children was, was nothing new. The difference was this year that the volume of those encounters was so great um, that, um, and I won't say unexpected, but it was so great that we realized very quickly that the facilities that we had within CBP, which are not designed to be detention facilities, as um, was earlier mentioned, they're designed to be short-term hold before we transfer them um, out of our, our custody, uh, just were simply not adequate for the volume that we were seeing in South Texas. Um, it was very apparent to us very early on in FY. 14 that we needed to make some changes and uh, just to um, give credit where credit's due, um, the Red Cross was the first on the scene um, in RGV when we determined that we needed some assistance. So with uh, blankets and water and toiletries and other things. And then of course after that a flood of support um, from the NGO community, um, the advocacy community uh, came came to our, our help. Um, from every with everything from showers to food service to um, uh, counseling, um, certainly recreation and other things that we as CBP had never had at our facilities before. Um, so that was something that as the year progressed, we um, had to adapt our operations to account for that. And really we went from a border enforcement operation apprehension um, mindset to a care and custody mindset. Um, we were not seeking out um, children and family units uh, crossing the border. They were literally coming to us. Um, our agents and our officers were uh, deploying and having people walk up and turn themselves in or children sitting on the side of the road. Um, quite frankly, for law enforcement agents and officers, that is not the easiest thing to see. Um, it's more akin to an emergency on the side of the road than an enforcement action or a vehicle stop. Um, it was, I, I've never seen agents um, really uh, do things that were so outside the scope of their training. Um, it was really, you know, impressive. So, um, we adjusted our operations. Um, we, you know, partnered with as many of the um, members in the community, the advocacy community that we could, um, and, you know, we worked our way through. Um, I think the assessment that not everything worked and some things did is, is extremely accurate. Um, since then, we have started to address those things earlier uh, in our planning effort, um, so we are now ensuring that our facilities that were uh, stood up during that crisis are now on hot standby, if you will, so that we can flip that switch if necessary. Um, the contracts that we put into place to make sure that we had the services necessary to address the uh, a future surge um, are in place and ready to be uh, implemented if necessary. Um, and we've certainly developed um, through the efforts at the department, uh, at DHS, and, and certainly within our, our partner agencies within DHS, we've put the plans and agreements in place to make sure that um, that relationship and those operations are more seamless than they have been in the past. Um, one of the things I think is important to note um, is that when the secretary put together the unified coordination group, um, we brought in... Uh, all of the agencies in a whole, whole government approach to address the problem, um, which is something that I think 
uh, helped us to adapt very quickly to what was going on. Um, everyone realized that the right place for a child or for a family um, to remain is not within a Border Patrol station. Um, so as, as was earlier mentioned, um, the key aspect of that whole of government approach was to move these um, children through the system much quicker so that they were not staying in Border Patrol stations and facilities for longer periods of time. Um, of course, we were capping out at that 72-hour mark um, quite often. Um, by the end of the surge or by the, you know, the, when we were in the midst of the surge, um, we had reduced that down to less than a day. Um, and that was only by um, partnering within the agency and partnering with some of your organizations in this room were we able to really make that happen. Um, and that was very important. Um, it may not seem a lot, and even though um, regular, you know, through regulation and statute, 72 hours is sort of where we draw the line of appropriate or not appropriate, but quite frankly, we didn't even feel as though you know, one night in the detention facility was appropriate when somebody has to sleep on a cement floor or cover themselves with a mylar blanket, right? So we tried to move um, children and families out of our custody as quickly as possible, even within an eight or 12 hour period. And by the, by the time we really got into the surge, that's, that's where we were at. Um, I think it's important to note that we experienced other things that we had never experienced before either. Um, certainly we do tours and hotels and other things almost on a continuous basis throughout the year. Um, but in the midst of that <coughs> experience, the volume of that outside activity increased um, almost to a point where we couldn't, we couldn't manage the visits and tours that we were giving on it day-to-day -day basis. So we're looking now at, um, in the future, doing a that a little bit, we're doing that in a more organized way as opposed to in, that, in the ad hoc request way that um, we did last year. Uh, that's important because um, it goes to some of that important monitoring and, and important um, access to our facilities that um, really we haven't, we haven't provided in the, in the past. As a law enforcement secure facility um, where we are also handling other um, people that we have apprehended or encountered, um, criminal aliens and others, um, we had to be very careful about separating vulnerable children and families from the normal, the normal population of people we had in our facilities. So um, as we were working through that and as we were redesigning our facilities to make sure that those separations and uh, of the populations happened, um, it was very difficult to um, have the, an almost continuous rotation of, of people come through tours and other things. But I will say that um, early on, we in that redesign of our facilities, we stood up uh, many of the, the same services that you find in an in, in ICE uh, detention facility or in an ORR um, lower security level facility. So recreation, um, child uh, care or playrooms um, and other things that literally we carved out of closets and, and other areas within our stations to make sure that they had access to. Um, really a monumental effort I think on on you know, all of our agencies within DHS, certainly with, with FEMA's help as well and, and others from the um, from within the, the federal government. Um, and certainly with with the help of the, the advocacy community. Um, even today, we're still meeting on a regular basis to look at some of those procedures and policies, um, questions for screening uh, for credible fear cases and other other items. Um, we're still working through that with some of, some of the groups in this room. Um, and taking those suggestions and making those changes where necessary. And, and we're very committed to doing that. Um, we really don't want to see the situation that we saw this past year. Um, and I think we, as an agency, CBP, learned a lot. Um, and, and hopefully we've taken steps to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, but it's always good to work together to make sure that we, we have those those systems and relationships in place if, if it does happen again. Um, in terms of prevention, I think it's it's good to uh, look at what we did last year with the Dangerous Campaign. Um, we had 
we had funded a campaign in the Central and South American countries to um, help describe the conditions of the journey, help describe what was awaiting them in the United States, um, describe some of those things that they might encounter with working with those criminal organizations that were facilitating the smuggling. Uh, and I, I think that so far has proven to be a, a, a very valuable messaging campaign for all of us. Um, certainly now we've, we've turned some of that messaging toward uh, describing the, uh, uh, the situation with the executive action and what may result from that. Um, and, and making sure that we're communicating properly and messaging to um, all of the, you know, anybody who would be a prospective crosser or, or um, immigrant at this point. Um, but we're, we're still putting a lot of effort into that messaging and making sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're being diligent about understanding the, the impact of that. So um, I think with that, though, I will uh, turn it over to my partner and I look forward to your questions. I created myself a handy standing microphone thing. I feel like I need to do karaoke. Yeah, look like at that. that. Nice thinking outside the box yet again. Um, all right, so uh, I don't anticipate leaving the room here with any endorsement of family residential centers, which is what we call family detention. Um, this was a decision point above ICE's paper. So we were told to implement it, and we're trying to do it the best way we can. I want to kind of give you statistics to kind of get you some familiarity of the numbers. So right now, if adult detention has 27,000 persons in it, that is a low drop from the usual uh, 34,000 that's requested by Congress each year, uh, which I'm sure the Congress will not be happy with uh, if that maintains a statistic throughout the fiscal year. Uh, right now, we have 800 persons into family residential centers, which is about 350 families. Uh, that is over, over 60,000 persons who came across during the summer. The vast majority of her families are in the communities which they wanted to reside in, uh, usually through a mechanism of release that includes border recognizance that was given to them at the border, uh, and they're told to show up to the field office and enroll likely into an alternative detention program that includes GPS monitoring and telephonic reporting. So, stat-wise, um, 800 persons, 350 families. 60,000 persons are not in family residential centers. Uh, we had four at one point. We now have only three. Uh, those currently in existence include the Burks facility in Pennsylvania, which has about 78 persons into it. Uh, we have the facility that uh, Carnt, which is our flagship civil detention facility, which was converted to a family facility that has about 485 persons into it. Uh, and the new facility that was built with families in mind in Dilly, Texas, which we call the South Texas Family Residential Center, uh, which has about 213 persons as of Sunday. Uh, what do we need to ensure that we build these residential centers per the direction of leadership? What do they look like and how should they operate? Well, since we've operated first, we've taken that as what we call the platinum standard. Uh, we have a set of standards called the Family Residential Standards, which were uh, inputted with comments and uh, advice from the NGO community, many people in this room, uh, that include a much different uh, framework and landscape that you would see in an adult detention center. People can wear um, their own clothing. Uh, they're able to have non-institutionalized clothing if they need. Uh, there is ability for much more access to recreation and visitation, attorney access. Uh, meals are augmented with snacks and other things that are child appropriate. Each of our fa family facilities is uh, linked up with the Child Advocacy Center to ensure that child care are needed to mitigate sexual abuse or side effects or issues. Uh, we have uh, robust mental health counseling. Uh, some say it's not as robust, so this week we had a meeting with our department and we're going to look to partner with uh, organizations that can provide augmented services for trauma care. That's something I've been tasked to do. Uh, we have the ability uh, of a call center that I stood up uh, that used to be called the Community Detaining Helpline. It's now called the Detention Reporting and Information Line. That any day, any time, the people can pick up the phone and uh, report a complaint, concern, or issue, and we have the ability to uh, resolve that in real time. Uh, we have educational opportunities. Uh, we ensure that there are uh, translated translated documents. We ensure that people have access to interpreters. Uh, we realize there are some deficiencies with some uh, indigenous dialects, and so we're working right now to ensure our contract providers 
get people who may not have maybe a traditional oral language, such as Kiche, uh, et cetera. So that is something we're working on. Uh, we have safeguards uh, with regards to preventing uh, sexual assault and abuse. Uh, each of our family facilities has a PREA coordinator. Each of our family facilities, every staff has gone through PREA training. Uh, we want to ensure that people, uh, there's not sexual abuse or sexual assault in these facilities. In addition, um, in the near term, I have partnerships with the, the Lutherans and the Catholics, and I'm hoping we can get them on board to start doing releases to pro bono holistic community services, uh, releasing out of detention. It is correct that releases from detention are only by grant of a bond uh, from the immigration judge. That is something I think will change in the near future. And I believe in the near future we will have uh, community social work release alternatives that are funded by the government, uh, which will be a change. Uh, so we are thinking outside the box when it comes to how we maintain what amounts to less than 2% of the family population in the United States has crossed. Uh, in all transparency, the facilities are forecasted to grow. Uh, Burks will double in size, Carnes will double in size, and Artesia could be the largest family facility ever in uh, 2,400 beds. Um, that, that is based upon the need if we see the flow as it comes. So we have done lots of preventive measures, as my CVP partner talked about. Those include, with our Homeland Security Investigation side of the house, prosecutions of those smugglers. Those include working with the State Department and USAID to do in-country processing, informational campaigns, outreach campaigns that say, do not come to the country. Uh, legally, persons that do cross who are arriving uh, are subject to mandatory detention. So that, the releases that are happening with thousands and thousands of persons are releases where, if we have the residential capacity, should be in residential confinement until we can see who they are with an asylum officer, do a credible fear determination, and then do a release from that perspective. Um, so a lot of the safeguards we've done through detention reform for adult facilities have been into place at our family facilities, and we're continuing to think outside the box when it comes to family care. Uh, I do not uh, have direct oversight of that, but it is in the same operational component, and I can tell you the staff uh, leadership that is there is thinking outside the box uh, when it comes to trying to do new think uh, in terms of family assistance. Uh, this week, as we mentioned the access policy, some people probably would have been here if they weren't in Dili taking the tour, which happened this week. Um, and that happened, and I know that uh, already, uh, because we want people to their opinions to go out. I know there was media calls on this, and they shared their thoughts on what, what they saw. Um, but our internal debrief from them is that, you know, the facility that we had in Artesia, which is now closed, the Dilly is better, and we're getting better. And we closed that facility for three reasons. That was a stand-up makeshift facility at a former Border Patrol training site that was meant to be long-term care. So it is very, very important to get the feedback from the, the community. And I... Uh, count as a personal achievement the access policy because I was the person that ran it through to get signed. Uh, I believe strongly that each of you have opinions. You all have expertise beyond that I have or the rest of the staff have. Uh, at the end of it, um, we are core law enforcement individuals uh, and we need to make sure that if you see a deficiency, you let us know about it and we take steps to mitigate it, such as partnering with uh, domestic violence organizations do crisis intervention, such as augmenting mental health services, such as more child care uh, options, um, such as uh, one thing we did is the forms that we started giving them at the border. Um, you know, very legalistic forms. And so we started giving flyers that explained what these meant in plain language, in Spanish, and other languages. Uh, we took steps. We wanted to work with partners in uh, local Catholic churches to and augment their services at reception sites. Um, so we, we do try to, again, as an executive branch agency, execute the mission that we're given. Uh, and the task that we were given was to ensure that we had some capacity beyond the Burke's facility to uh, house families uh, that were taken in together. Uh, and those were the three facilities now that exist. More can be done, even more should be done, and that's what we're going to do, that's what we're committing to do. Uh, we have an ongoing partnership with um, both organizations that I sit here at ACLU and the Women's Refugee Commission to do more improvements. Uh, and in the coming in the future, I'm very, very excited about plans to further partner with our faith-based providers and to further fund um, alternatives 
uh, to family residential confinement that include um, case management, uh, which I think might prove something that would revolutionize how we do detention for adults. Uh, and it's something um, UNHCR has prompted us to do. It's something we have gone and studied internationally. The Australians do this. So I think this is a very informative time. Uh, and I think that uh, we are, are looking at this experimentation that is residential centers, how this is going. And uh, I know there are adamant opinions in the room about how you think it's going. Uh, and I think we're taking that into, uh, we're, we're looking at that. Uh, and that's being informed at the highest levels. Um, and when decisions change, we will, we will execute that mission. But we're thinking outside the box when it comes to alternatives. We're trying to do the best care we can with our ability to, to house these individuals. Uh, so with that, uh, I will left leave the rest for questions after uh, Joanne details the, the latest ACLU lawsuit against ICE. <laughs> 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 Can't Andrew, because it has not yet been filed. All right, this will be, <laughs> be recorded. <laughs> 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 um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. My name is Joanne Lowe. I'm the Director of the ACLU. Uh, National Legislative Office here in Washington, D.C. Um, good afternoon to all of you who are live streaming and following us um, online. I did want to say that we have a bunch of materials that are here at the front of the room, and um, please come forward, and uh, there are plenty of copies here, and I'll be sure to send electronic versions of the materials to the conference organizers. <coughs> Um, I think my co-panelists have done a marvelous job of describing the array of government um, procedures and responses to what happened in 2014, a true humanitarian crisis in South Texas. Um, I had the luxury of kind of honing in and focusing a little bit more on just two primary themes, and I'm going to do that through, um, uh, through a variety of real-life case examples. So I know it's after lunch, and people are probably getting the, the sugar lull, but um, I ask you to just bear with me. Um, so um, I want each of us to think of two photo images. The first is a photograph of a Central American toddler and her mom in a detention facility locked up in South Texas. The second is a photo of a three-year-old in immigration court, standing next to a government lawyer and facing an immigration judge. That three-year-old is alone, trying to figure out what's going on, but also tasked with representing herself in court and in removal proceedings. Both of those images are real images, and they are not fictitious, nor are they aberrational. They are the picture of what's happening in South Texas. <coughs> The first one, the, the, the reference to the Central American toddler, her mom, this is really the image that, that points to the new face of mass incarceration in the United States. As Andrew just mentioned, the new South Texas facility located in Dilly, Texas, will have a capacity of up to 2,400 beds. That will make it the single largest immigration detention facility in the nation when it's fully operational. Um, that facility is, is being run by Corrections Corporation for America, a private prison company. And this facility is charging nearly $300 per person per bed per night, making this a very costly enterprise that is being borne by U.S. taxpayers. Beyond the dollar figures, the numbers associated with the rapid increase in family detention are truly staggering. Andrew's absolutely correct that the majority of arriving families are not placed in immigration detention. However, if you look at the ramp up in family detention facilities over the last five and a half years, I'm sorry, over the last year, we have gone from fewer than 100 family detention beds as recently as May 2014 to an anticipated 3,700 beds sometime this year. That's an exponential dramatic increase that has taken place in less than one year time. Now what's happening to these kids and moms once they're locked up by ICE? Jennifer already mentioned that there have been numerous reports of sexual abuse taking place inside some of these family detention facilities. I just wanted to highlight one complaint that was prepared by the Mexican American Legal Defense Education Fund and the University of Texas Immigration Law Clinic. And that complaint was filed in the fall, and the allegations include 
Um, reports of facility guards removing female detainees from their cells late at night and the early morning hours for the purpose of engaging in sexual acts in various parts of the facility and attempting to cover up these actions. Guards calling women the, um, their novias or girlfriends and requesting sex sexual favors from detainees in exchange for money, promises of assistance with their immigration case and shelter if and when they're ever released. And guards kissing, fondling, and groping women detainees in front of others, including children. It boggles the mind that this administration is choosing to lock up moms and kids. And Andrew's absolutely right that this decision has been made at the highest levels of the Obama administration. It is not an ICE um, responsible decision. But it still boggles the mind since many of these moms and kids have experienced brutal sexual violence in their home countries. For example, in one recent family case, a five-year-old child had been sexually victimized in the home country. ICE refused to release this family, but instead insisted on locking them up, thereby causing the child <coughs> victim to suffer additional unnecessary psychological damage. In another recent case, a child with brain cancer, along with the mom, were locked up by ICE. The mom had been interviewed by an asylum officer who concluded that deporting this family could very well result in harm. And despite this positive, credible fear determination, the administration refused to release the family and only changed their mind after an attorney obtained documentation from a medical expert confirming that the child's brain cancer was indeed life-threatening. So the brain cancer case and the sexual assault cases beg the question, why does this, this administration insist on locking up these traumatized moms and kids? And what's at stake here? You know, it's undisputed that many of these families have fled to South Texas, coming from the most violent regions in the world, where domestic abuse, sexual violence, murder of women and girls is rampant and goes unpunished. Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala have some of the worst femicide and gender violence rates in the world. And the accounts being shared by the families that arrive here are absolutely grisly. Therefore, it's no exaggeration to say that when our government decides to deport a family, that decision could be a matter of life and death. So given the gravity of the situation and what's at stake, it's absolutely imperative that our administration provide an individualized assessment for each family and not just impose a blanket policy decision of detain and deport. Justice and humanity demand nothing less and our Constitution requires this. The administration's family detention practices violate both U.S. and international law which require that immigration judges make individualized determinations of flight risk and safety threat. Leading members of Congress have sharply criticized the administration's overly aggressive family detention practices, noting that moms and kids fleeing violence should not be treated like criminals, and, and the administration's ship and back policy is wholly out of whack with ICE's reforms on the detention front, as well as with our country's long-standing commitment to protecting moms and kids and families from family abuse, sex violence, and violence. So let's go back to the second image for a moment, and that was the image of the three-year-old trying to represent herself in court opposite a government prosecutor standing before a judge. Now, for any of us who've had three-year-olds, and, and I've had two of them, um, I think we would all agree that it's hard to get our three-year-olds to sit through supper, clean their <coughs> room, brush their teeth. So the idea of a three-year-old standing up in court with a bunch of grown-ups in a very grown-up proceeding and telling the judge what has happened to her and why she doesn't want to go back to her home country, now we're officially in the realm of the absurd. And I wish that were so, but it isn't. Because the three-year-old that I'm referring to is named Arturo, and he's from El Salvador, and he fled for his life. And he has been placed in deportation proceedings. He has no lawyer and obviously cannot afford one. Today, less than one third of children facing deportation have no legal I'm sorry. Today, less than one third of children facing deportation have legal representation. So last year, the ACLU brought a national class action seeking to ensure that all children in immigration court have legal representation. Without counsel, children are 
forced to represent and defend themselves in these Byzantine legal proceedings that take place in English, involving fully competent, educated adults. There is no way anyone could call this a fair, reasonable legal process, and the consequences are dire and can be a matter of life and death. We strongly believe that all children facing deportation must have their own attorney. If they cannot obtain their own counsel, then the government must appoint a lawyer for them. This government has instead chosen to institute policies to expedite the processing and deportation of these children through so-called rocket dockets. These children and family cases have been moved up to the front of the immigration court queue and immigration judges are now operating under very strict timetables to process and hear these children's cases as quickly as possible. An immigration court system that requires children to represent themselves without counsel is fundamentally unfair and violates due process. It's also inhumane and morally indefensible. Given what we know about the violent conditions in the Northern Triangle region of Central America, we should be loath to deport any child, especially a child who had no immigration attorney to represent her. You know, we, we live here and work here in the District of Columbia where the motto is no taxation without representation. And at the ACLU, we strongly believe that should be extended to no deportation without representation. I look forward to receiving your questions and comments. Well, thank you very much, all four of you, for some very thoughtful comments, and uh, I look forward to the questions to come. Uh, let's see. Well, let's see. Let's start at the top. Um, do you see family detention moving in a positive direction, and why might there be differing opinions on this matter? Who wants to take the first stab at that? I could take a first stab at this, and I'm going to first take <laughs> the opportunity to address some of the issues Joanne brought up. Um, first, with regards to the sexual assault complaints, uh, it was one individual who complained to the attorney, uh, her, her counsel. Uh, it was thoroughly investigated by the Office of Inspector General, and no, uh, it was found to be unsubstantiated. No evidence could be found of any of the claims. There are wide accusations, fair and far between. The Office of Inspector General just closed this case out, I believe, last week uh, with a very thorough uh, investigation by the request of ICE. Um, I can tell you that in charge of PREA and sexual assault abuse prevention and intervention for the agency. Uh, we take these very, very seriously. Every time there's even a, a hint of issues, we, we make sure we, we deploy now a multidisciplinary team because, and this is the complexity when it comes to family detention, what is age appropriate developmental? Say their kids are playing doctor or just do doing normal kid things, but does that rise the level of uh, PREA incident, et cetera? So we deploy uh, mental health folks, we deploy uh, counselors, we now partner and ensure that the Child Advocacy Center is there, um, but uh, we have to, those, those wild allegations that were raised have been found to be thoroughly investigated and substantiated. Uh, the future of family residential confinement, what does that look like? Um, I think that it's still out there. While true, uh, the family facilities have the ability to forecast up that's because they'll be done in a phased approach based upon demand, and they're, they're at 800 right now because we actually don't have the demand that we that we need. So we're testing this with the ability, of course, to build up should there be the demand. Um, and I believe in this lull season, which is typical, if we can test some of these alternatives that we're, th we're contemplating actively, and we've done this with adults. We've partnered with the Lutherans and the Catholics to test at, at their expense. Uh, <laughs> You know, partnerships were released on community, and now we're going to do it at our expense when it comes to families. So I think we're able to look outside the box. So uh, I can't have a crystal ball. I can't forecast the political environment that this will be in a in, in few months. Um, I can tell you that if, if ICE is tasked to do this, we're going to do it to the best of our ability with environments that mitigate sexual assault. And if there's allegations that are made, such as those raised um, by MALDEF, Thorough, fast, appropriate investigations with everybody getting the type of counseling services and therapy services they need through the course of that investigation. <laughs> uh, just one comment. I think uh, last year we apprehended uh, or encountered um, nearly 68,000 family units. Um, that was almost 29,000 adults. The remaining were, uh, were children. <clears throat> One of the things in, that we've taken steps to ensure is that we are 
um, in our processing, our initial processing, that we are doing everything we possibly can to make sure that we are um, maintaining family unity. Um, a couple of years ago, we developed a hold room policy that made sure that families were remaining together um, in our facilities before they were transferred out of out of our care and custody. Um, and then one of the things we looked at last year in 2014 was making sure that we were able to expand the definition of what was a family unit. So um, in the past, there were issues where um, brothers and sisters or uncles and aunts and children may not have been able to remain together. Um, we've now taken steps to make sure that there, if there's um, any variation that wouldn't normally fall within um, current definitions of family units, we've now expanded that to make sure that they are able to remain together at, at, at a minimum while they're in our facilities. I mean, the only thing I have to say is, you know, there was a one small family facility that was intended to be um, set up for families more of in a protective nature. So the Burks facility, when it was being used, the intent was to house families who had nowhere else to go that were particularly vulnerable, had some sort of special need. It was more of a protective um, uh, goal in that situation. I think, you know, our concern is that these new facilities are intended to be more punitive. I mean, they're, they're being created, and DHS has made it very clear that they were created with the intent of stemming the tide of, 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 of centrance. And so we don't think that with a punitive goal that you're ever going to be able to get to a situation where you can house families, detain families humanely, and that it, it may need, there may be special programs that can help protect these vulnerable populations, but doing so in a punitive m manner and for the purposes of deterrence is inappropriate. I, mean, I find the question interesting because I think the developments on the family detention front over the last year have all been negative. And from an advocate's perspective and working closely with service providers around the country, it's gotten progressively worse. And um, I will say that the ACLU has worked closely with many people in the administration on some of the immigration executive actions that were announced in November. And in that vein, we saw the president really put a focus on preserving um, mixed status families, people who are here in the United States with children who are US citizens or permanent <coughs> residents, and ensuring that they are not split apart unnecessarily and deported. And yet at the same time, we've seen the same administration aggressively target and sue deportations of families, this time families who are fleeing for their lives, the most horrific conditions documented in the world, and strong evidence that many of them would apply for political, uh, um, qualify for political asylum. The family detention story is all about sending the deterrence message, as Jennifer mentioned, so sending a message to would-be migrants who might um, be considering taking the journey to the United States. But it's also very political, and you know the Sec Secretary Jay Johnson said this recently, I think in December, where he said the message should be clear: as a result of our new emphasis on the security of the southern border, it, it will now be more likely that you will be apprehended. It will now be more likely that you will be detained and sent back. And so that's all about sending a message. It's not about <coughs> ensuring that people who arrive here get fair treatment and adjudication of their asylum claims. Okay, um, this one's to Jennifer. Uh, you mentioned that some things did go well last summer, and the question I would like you to sort of elaborate on, what, what was the positive of last summer's experience? Um, well, I think I'm specifically referring to that there is some advantage to streamlining the reunification process for children who are, for unaccompanied children who are in the OR facilities. I, mean, I don't think anybody wants to see a child lingering in a detention facility if they don't have to be. Um, so I think the idea that we're going to be able to get a child to a family member who's willing to care for them for the duration of their immigration court process is definitely an advantage. I think that there are some concerns in that when you are doing that streamlining and, and quickening the process, so you're not cutting any corners um, that would put the child at risk or um, anything that, um, you're not getting rid of any checks that are intended to protect a child. Um, so I think that's specifically what I was referring to, but thinking about the question, I mean, I do think, look, this is a population that's always been coming to the U.S., right? There have always been thousands of unaccompanied kids traveling to the U.S. There's always been family units traveling to the U.S. It's been a very um, hidden population. 
And, you know, there's some issues that affected these populations that got a lot of attention last year, which I think are good. And, um, you know, as my colleagues from DHS have mentioned, have really caused the government to evaluate, you know, what kinds of programs they're running and are these really the best. And one example is the CDP facilities. I mean, there really were no pictures. Nobody really had any idea what these CBP facilities looked like until the pictures came out last year. And I know I made a comment earlier saying, you know, they were kind of disastrous and they weren't really helpful. But, you know, CBP was was put in a position where they had to reevaluate kind of the conditions in which they're holding people and they're starting to make strides. I mean, they're considering now implementing um, public standards on these short-term hold facilities, which they never had before. So, you know, it, it, it was a dire picture, but I think there are a few things that could come out of this. Uh, this next question I think is interesting because it was also raised this morning and it gets to the issue of what is the availability of options for us to act preventatively and maybe even preventatively beyond our borders? So what in your roles, either governmental or otherwise, what sorts of opportunities do you have to take a preventative approach to immigration and preventative approach to possible detention, maybe even as going to the countries of origin of some of the migrants and try to affect change in that way as opposed to seeing it as sort of a punitive process by which they arrive, you detain them, or you, 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 you encounter them, you detain them, and then have to go through the removal process. I, I, from CBP's perspective, I think that there are two most notable things that we've done from a preventive standpoint. The first was the, the refunding of the dangerous campaign, which was a very aggressive messaging campaign um, in, the, in the sending countries. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, the, con you know, the conditions um, of the journey, talked a little bit about what was um, available to them when they arrived in the United States. Um, it talked a lot about uh, what the smuggling organizations were saying versus what was the reality in uh, in the process. Um, and then I think the second thing is really a, a targeted effort at addressing those smuggling organizations both um, within the United States, within Mexico, and within those sending countries as well. And so we're really, um, and we always have, but we will continue and, and, and to a more aggressive, um, in a more aggressive way, you know, target some of those smuggling organizations that are taking advantage or exploiting um, the fact that they're they're um, you know dealing in, in children and families, um, so I think both of those things you know they go hand in hand. Um, I think you have to address you know as many of those issues as you can. And I think those are two really strong strong positions that CBP took early on um, and will continue to take. We've, we've of course um, re renewed our uh, dangerous campaign, added some additional messaging to that, and then of course we've got some. Uh, smuggling and criminal organization targeting efforts that we're working on right now with our partners throughout the government. Thanks. Anybody else want to? <clears throat> to be frank, I mean, I think we're caught looking in the wrong place right now in terms of solving this problem. I mean, we're stuck in this entire conversation is about this um, detention and deportation machine that we have going on. We're spending a lot of money. I mean, Joanne talked about how expensive it is to have these family detention facilities. Um, building up CBP is very expensive. I mean, the U.S. government is spending a lot of money on this detention and deportation machine. Um, and that's not going to stop the problem, right? You put your finger on a little leak, the butter is going to come out somewhere else. So the problem is, there's a problem in, these, in the sending countries. And so the U.S. has been spending money at ability to spend a lot of money to really address the root causes um, and not in terms of for political gain or, or what have you to really just kind of build up this machine because it's not going to do any good and it's a waste of our money um, so we really need to be thinking about what is it if the U.S. is going to be spending money is it better to spend hiring more agents I mean, if you have agents on the border and people are turning themselves in is that really what we need or do we really need to try to solve the problem in these countries so people aren't going to come in the first place we don't have to be spending all this money. George, 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 this question is really to you, and it's from George, but uh, uh, Andrew, kind of a straightforward question about the facilities. Are they ICE run or are they contracted out or a mixture of both? So uh, we get this question a lot, but people don't like that we you know, contract these out. But uh, absent the Artesia facility, which is now closed, which was ICE run, 
uh, Berks, which is done by county officials, um, Carnes, which is done by the Geo Corporation, uh, and Dilly, South Texas, which is done by Correctional Corporation of America, are contracted out. However, I believe strongly, which is the bedrock of the you know framework of how we do a lot of business in this country, that providers will do what you ask of them, and that you have to be as the uh, ultimate decision maker responsible for oversight and compliance. Uh, every level and area of government has procurement and contracting, uh, and we need to ensure through contract oversight how these things are run. Uh, I think we've done a good job of doing that. We've ensured that in terms of staffing plans, that the folks are recruited with backgrounds with knowing how to deal with children, that they get their correct training. Um, these facilities are built with families in mind. They are not um, built or converted with families in mind. They're not built to be punitive at any uh, in any regard at all. The, the reason for family residential confinement is to ensure obligation to court proceedings and that the, uh, other, other requirements that are dictated under law. Um, so this is very, very important that we work with our providers to ensure that we have effective oversight and the staffing at the for ICE at these facilities is much more robust than it usually is in adult facilities. Uh, for instance, you know the medical a lot of it's done by the public health service, uh, and a lot of we have on-site uh, officers to do that. Sometimes are usually remote when it comes to adult facilities or on-site. So uh, much more higher ICE presence, et cetera. Uh, and so, but I do feel strongly that contract providers can do the job as asked for them with very good oversight. And Thanks. Okay, let me take some of my questions from the room. Are there any questions? Anybody here in the room have questions? That was a chance to. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for for the, the the information that you shared. With all due respect to you, sir, from ICE, um, there were only few one one or few complaints around sexual abuse in the detention center, and it was we investigated, and there was nothing. Um, I did not say that. That's the allegation that was mentioned by Ms. Lynn uh, was investigated by the Inspector General's office and was found to be substantiated. There's been others which have also been similarly investigated. Okay, so um, I'm I'm uh, now an American, but I came here recently, and I met English is not my first language. So every single time I have to talk to somebody, I think twice, right. and I'm nervous, and I'm not sure. And I'm I'm working here as a senior advisor in the international services. So my position is all right. I've, I studied in English school and everything else. But I still feel nervous, right? And so when, when you have these women who are already scared, who, who are being investigated, and A, first, they may not complain at all if they're going through that. So if there are a few complaints, that's already an indic indicator something's going on, more than what we know. Second thing, once they're investigated, they must be so, so much more nervous because that might make sure that they, they're going to be deported or, or penalized. So so we cannot just undermine or, or make it look little that it was investigated and nothing came up. Because if there are complaints, it's a serious issue. And you mentioned there are counselors and things like that. They're during the day. What happens in the night? You know, those questions, do you have cameras? What kind of what kinds of measures have been taken to, to, to take care of that. So I did not mean to diminish the ability for ICE to do like PREA investigations. We, DHS has instituted its own PREA standard for regulation at the request of many people in this room. Uh, and that includes very much robust oversight, including the ability to access many avenues of confidential reporting, individualized reporting, etc. Uh, in addition, there are 30-minute checks at each resident per night ensuring that there's no uh, issues going on. Uh, we allow for the call center, the hotline. We uh, allow for the ability for them to access NGOs, uh, family members, uh, counselor uh, persons, uh, attorneys, etc. We have multiple reporting abilities. Uh, we also will take uh, many, any unfounded, any type of confidential allegation from any other source. Uh, this is something we worked on with, uh, it's required by regulation, it's something that we put into effect. Uh, so while there's definitely some concerns out there in terms of rampant uh, sexual abuse issues, it, it is not happening at the level that people may assume. Uh, and they do have the avenues of access that are, uh, there's a, an atmosphere where they feel comfortable enough to make those, 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 uh, those allegations to individuals, including non-governmental representatives 
so they can actually reflow those things. Hi, this message is for George. Uh, I have a question about CBP in other countries and whether CBP is involved at all in training. Uh, and in particular, does the training include anything about identifying protection needs? Just interested in particular in this region. So the the answer the the answer to your first the first part of your question is yes. Um, CBP has a tremendously robust presence um, in in a number of countries, certainly within Mexico and other Central and South American countries. Um, and and I think the answer to the second part of the question is yes. To um, we're certainly sharing best practices um, within. Mexico, we worked extensively with their government to address some of the smuggling organizations and how they were crossing from um, South and Central America into Mexico. Uh, and then the, um, a really almost horrific journey that they were taking you know, on top of trains and other things. Um, so there was training there um, about how to address that, to um, target those smuggling organizations. And there, were also, there was also um, some coordination and communication between um, the U.S. government and the Mexican government about uh, identifying um, the at-risk population, kids and family units that may be part of that, um, you know, part of that group that's making the journey. And we also worked with the Mexican government to engage with um, NGOs that were located in um, in those transit countries or, or zones. Uh, Catholic Charities comes to mind, but you know, we certainly um, reached out to a number of them. To make sure that there were facilities available um, to provide water and food and shelter, at least for a, a, a short time during the journey. Um, so I, I, I think there's probably more there. I, you know, I don't have a, a complete picture of what our our attaches and, and folks are doing downrange. Um, I know there we do have a continuous interaction with with those governments to um, try to provide them advice and assistance when we can. Thank you. I'm uh, Christine Block from the Canadian Red Cross. Um, I'm very interested to hearing more about the alternatives to detention, and especially to this whole case management uh, proposal, because uh, in Canada we do not really have facilities for families that can house families, and one of the things we have been moving on has been alternatives to detention, and we are trying to look at models for um, for going forward. So I can talk about that, and I want to thank Canada, because in a way you helped this, because it was in Canada with the Australian Red Cross brought together by the UNHCR that we talked about these models. So the Australian Red Cross actually provides kind of case management services for their released uh, adults. Uh, and so we profiled them for a number of years. Uh, and you know, I internally have been a big advocate of this. Uh, and we were able to get off the ground two MOUs with our Lutheran Catholic partners to test this with adults, with about 100 people. Um, at, again, at the backs and expense of these organizations, these faith-based organizations, and, and it's proved successful for the 100 people. Now, the scale does not give me the big kind of talking point that I want, considering 400,000 persons go through immigration detention a year. But 100 people, nonetheless, was sufficient enough to get us moving in a direction where we can lift off. I hope in the near term assuming that the United States Congress funds the Department of Homeland Security for a full budget year, which we hope they would, uh, that we could do something in the world of uh, holistic uh, case management. And basically, um, my talking points to get this off the ground, which people were persuaded by, is everything old is new again. So this is exactly what we used to do uh, when we partnered in the long time when immigration started, enforcement in this country started, early 20th century. And it has proven wildly successful internationally. And it has proven successful on the limited scale we've done it for adults in the domestic United States. So I think it's something we could test for families. I think families are the most meritorious because we're not facing the criminal background that we face with adults, which sometimes can be the stumbling blocks uh, between some of our partners on these things. So families are very meritorious for these things. Families mainly have housing already identified, which is the biggest cost driver of these programs. So uh, with, with housing already done, all we've got to do is ensure basically a life coach. 
You need to get to court. You need to get to get on the plane if you need to. And all the other the rest of the stuff, which I feel by important, but from an ICE perspective, might be a little bit of gravy. You know, if, you know, making sure you have educational opportunities, access to transportation, all these things. We, that is also good. You know, um, when Women's Refugee Commission isn't here, I take credit for this analogy. Michelle. For a name. <laughs> she always said to me, you know, Andrew, we have traditional AT, which is a contract um, called ISAP, intensive supervision, which we predominantly use ankle bracelets with, right? And she says, it doesn't make sense for a schizophrenic to get a, a talking ankle bracelet. You know, sometimes you think outside the box. And that makes, and that's the truth. Sometimes one size doesn't fit all. ICE believes you have to have a continuum of options to ensure that the job can get done under legal mandate, meaning show up for your court appointment. If you're still ordered to be removed, you do so. If you're good gain relief, fine. Uh, and there are many means by which internationally countries have shown to do this that don't include brick and mortar detention. Some may require brick and mortar detention. Our two detention buckets for adults are uh, intake from the criminal justice system, you know, from prisons and jails, and border crossers. So for people who lack the, the, the criminal backgrounds, asylum secret border crossers, alternative detention that we're talking about with holistic case services, Big buckets of pull from. Anybody else want to comment on that? Before I... And the financial aspects of it much cheaper? The financial aspects of it are, yes, could be cheaper. Um, especially if it doesn't include housing. Uh, what we have to do is make ins ensure that the entire system works at, together. Because if you're on all terms of attention for a long time on a non detained document, it could be, on the aggregate, more expensive. Uh, but it is something that the department is ensuring that uh, this is not an expense that we're going to utilize and uh, not be an efficiency of, of government tax dollars. <coughs> Hello. Um, I have a question for you from ICE. Um, you know what CBP here? I see if he never shows up and now he's not getting his money. <laughs> I love this. Feel free. Feel free. Well, well, the second part may be relevant okay. to you as well. But um, when you all do receive these complaints, um, assuming that you have a name or, or a description of who is being accused, um, what happens to that person? Are they fired or? Sure. Are you talking about sexual assault? Yeah, if it's sexual or any type of abuse. So uh, <laughs> again, and this is something I, I will, uh, this is something a lot of people don't work very well strong. We had a sexual assault standard. We've had sets of immigration detention standards for each of our facilities going back to the year 2000, building off a set of standards by the American Bar Association. Each of those had a sexual assault <coughs> kind of um, section. Um, many folks built that wasn't good enough, and so DHS worked for regulation to incorporate as the DOJ, PREA, Prison Rate Elimination Act requirements. And so there's a huge, robust regulatory system set up on how we have to respond to allegations, including the ability to respond, even if it's anonymous, how we respond to those individual claims. So many ways by which they can do this. Um, and per regulation and, uh, and policy, we want to make sure that happens. One is my call center, which people have the ability to pick up and call. But we also should and rightly get, if we get a complaint in a letter, same set of protocols. If we get a, we hear a complaint in the media, we put ensure a same set of protocols. And some of these protocols that I failed to just kind of specifically cite includes the, the ability to get victim advocates. Each person has the ability to write to get a victim advocate. Each of our facilities are aligned with a rape crisis center. Each of our facilities are aligned um, with the Child Protective Services site. Uh, each uh, each of those individuals will get crisis intervention at their so choosing. Each of those individuals. Um, will ensure that each of the staff has received robust training uh, on prevention of sexual assault and abuse, uh, forensic uh, exams, uh, ability for uh, follow-up care, um, and, and, and sometimes the ability to get information on the U visas uh, regarding if there is potentially the ability for uh, that to flow, which is an ability with a visa to, to stay. Um, so I think we've done very well with regards to the prevention of sexual assault. Right, but what happens to the officer that is, or so the person that is So if there's an allegation accused. made against a, a, they are removed from a contact with the detainee population until there is the ability to do the investigation. Okay. And then have there been any talks of improving the current facilities, um, such as adding carpet, heating, just little things that for when they are having to stay there for longer than 24 hours. Um, someone mentioned that or it may have been another panel, but you know they're having to sleep on cement floors. Um, are there so is there that, any improvement? So there's made? a difference of, of what facilities look like. 
right? So in general, um, facilities do not look like cement slabs. So this is a picture of the facility uh, in Carnes, Texas, right? And this is the basketball courts and the bunk beds, right? And this is the ping pong room and the band recreation room. So I have these pictures that I could show the rest of the staff. These aren't CBP hold rooms. These are facilities that, uh, and I'm sure CBP is now getting carpet, but uh, <laughs> these facilities are have play activities. They have um, uh, bedding. They're, they're child friendly. They have, in Dilly, Texas, what we did is we converted uh, an old oil worker village uh, where their families were housed, where the oil workers were housed. They're modular homes uh, with a kitchenette in the middle and two bedrooms off to the side. Um, uh, with phone access right there to make allegation support. You know what I need to do? Call the command center. Um, so it's 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 not. Again, the pictures show more justice to it, uh, but th these are not uh, cold rooms. The, the long-term facilities over 72 hours are meant to care for families. So, so I think I should address. I think it was my comment earlier about, and I think several of us have mentioned. Um, you know, CBP facilities. You know. We have cement floors and cement benches. Um, they were designed to be very short-term hold rooms. Uh, some of the things that came up during um, last year's uh, surge were things like the temperature, um, bedding, and other things. Uh, I, I'd also mentioned earlier the the fact that we also um, have other people that, that we've encountered or apprehended. Um, that don't fall in the in the child or family unit category. In fact, um, mathematically, uh, you know, we apprehended 479,300 people last year, and really about 68,000 of those. So a small percentage really fell within the, the unaccompanied children category. Uh, however, uh, what we did is we took um, suggestions and other things from. Um, all of the folks that were working in our facilities, including the advocacy community, um, and we started to make adjustments to those facilities to make sure that there was adequate space. Um, I mentioned the, you know, playrooms, recreation, um, outdoors, <coughs> and other things that we didn't traditionally have. And then we looked at actually some of the facilities themselves to make sure that the rooms that were holding um, children or family units had more in terms of comfort. Um, made sure that things like the temperature and other things were being monitored more closely. Um, we had a, a juvenile coordinator that was assigned um, last year at every one of the um, Border Patrol facilities to ensure that um, they, their job was specific, specifically to monitor um, the care and custody of the kids. Uh, we, had, we had brought in a number of medical staff also to make sure that they were constantly um, being monitored throughout the day uh, while they were in our care and custody. And we also addressed some of those other things that were a little um, more surprising to us. There's a tremendous number of uh, kids, families, and other um, adults that we encountered that had uh, medical issues, scabies, scarlet fever, um, chicken pox, you know, you name it. We probably saw it last year. So um, part of that effort was to bring in that medical staff as early as possible. Um, they wouldn't have traditionally <coughs> really gotten that until we transferred them to uh, an ICE facility or to an OR facility. We wanted to front load that effort um, and make sure that as soon as they came into the U.S. government's custody, we were getting those services to them. So from a comfort level, I mean, you don't want to sit, have, let somebody sit there with scabies or lights or anything else. If you, can, if you can mitigate that at the earliest possible moment, that's one of the things we tried to do. It. Um, really, we had brought in National Guard um, medical staff, Red Cross, and others to uh, to help do that. So, um, yeah, took a lot of those steps. Thank you all. I, I unfortunately we have to end. Um, some of the panels have to run to another other engagements and are up against their time block. But first, I want to thank you all for really stimulating conversation. Really, a lot of heavy thoughts. I, I would like to be able to have one last question, but and that was I would like to have you make a thirty second pitch on what you think is the key essential comment or thought to leave the audience with on, on attention, but I'm not sure we're going to have time for that. Okay, okay. so give me, give me 30 seconds. What, what is the one thing that you want the audience to leave with about detention? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, I think, very simply put, we could be doing much better. 
Um, I think we have an opportunity. This is a really good opportunity um, to sit back and reflect. I mean, we've had time. There was a surge last summer. The numbers have gone down a little bit. You know, people are expecting the numbers to go up now, and so I think what we need to be doing now is reflecting on what went well and what didn't go well and what is it that can be done to really improve. I think this is a unique opportunity right now. Uh, from the CBP perspective, I always go back to um, my roots, and I, you know, as a as a border patrol agent, um, our strategy, um, at least within the last couple of years and going forward for the next few, is uh, a focus on information integration and rapid response. And and really, I think that applies in this discussion as well. Um, we really have to know what's going on in our facilities. We really have to have the information that you're able to share with us, especially when you get feedback from the populations um, that we, that have come into our care and custody. Um, we, we really have to have that flow of information within the government and, and from, out, from outside the government as well. Um, we have to integrate in our facilities. We have to make sure that um, we do have access available for folks that can come in and provide those services that are, you know, necessary for, you know, the proper care and custody of kids and family units, um, as well as be able to um, work that population through the system as efficiently and effectively as we possibly can, um, you know, to make sure they're not staying in facilities they shouldn't be staying in, um, and then to make the changes, of course, to those facilities that we can to make that, that stay more comfortable. And then lastly, <laughs> Um, to be able to rapidly respond to the changing conditions um, in the in those demographics, um, I think that's something we learned last year and, and going forward in the future is when we see uh, changes in the demographics to more kids or family units or you know whatever we might see in the future, and we've got to be able to make very fast changes. Um, and so I, I had mentioned earlier, you know, we have some of those facilities we opened up um, this past year. Uh, on hot standby to be able to turn on that capability as quickly as possible um, and, and be rapid in our in our ability to uh, um, to take on the responsibility of that care and custody when we can. So everyone who knows me knows I'm an eternal optimist, um, and I will say, um, and I'll borrow from Walt Whitman. And when Walt Whitman, when he was a in this city, right, and speaking of the American Red Cross, was helping in Civil War hospitals. Uh, and was always asked, how do you keep your optimism up? How do you keep your happiness? He says, happiness, not for tomorrow, but for today, not for the next hour, but for this hour. So regardless of what the political landscape looks at in the future, um, I think the best thing we could do is partner together to make the reality that we have to execute a best reality for the families that are going through the political ramifications that are these decisions. And I think that's always been done with a good public, private, or faith-based NGO partnership. Uh, every of the accolades that I talk about with the Century Forum has been done in lockstep with our NGO, faith-based, and uh, private sector community. We can still do that. Um, some of, a lot of this decision making is beyond the pay grades of us, but for today and for this hour, let's make a difference and let's make it the best we can. Thanks. Two things. One, the new face of mass incarceration in the United States are Central American children and their moms. They are not criminals. They are coming to the United States seeking refugee and humanitarian protection, fleeing their homes, fleeing violence and horrific conditions. Two, no deportation without legal representation. No one, especially no child, should ever be permanently expelled to another country without having her own lawyer to screen her case, talk to her, and have the lawyer present the case before an immigration judge. Our Constitution, our justice system require it, as does our humanity. Thank you. You have a model I have well with it. <laughs> <laughs> Please come get the materials up front. Thanks very much. Thank you. Have a great day.